Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. You guys open your Bibles with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, the goal this morning is to look at verses 3 through 5. And what I want to discuss this morning is, is what is the falling away? And uh, it's a question that gets asked pretty frequently, especially if you're in the 2 Thessalonians and studying through the book there. And, uh, you know, what I've said is, is as we've gone through um, the book of 2 Thessalonians here, the key is, is to make sure when we're studying through it, we study it like we do the rest of our Bibles. You know, we study it in its proper context. Just because there's an end to a chapter doesn't mean that there's context from the previous chapter that carries over. It's, gonna, it's very important to look at it that way. And um, how we've been going through the study is the last time we talked about, and I think it's a key to talk about and define it's really important to define what the day of Christ is, specifically how it's being spoken about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because how it's discussed in other references is not the same way that it's mentioned here. In the other references, it's a day that Paul talks about looking forward to. It's a day of excitement. It's a day of joy. But here, some of the things that's described is causing the church to be troubled. And so, if you go look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and you look at verse 1, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be soon not shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by his letters from us, as that day of Christ is what? At hand. So it hasn't occurred. No. Then he says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, that when I was with you, get with you. What did he do? I told you, you see. So there was conversations and discussions of these things when Paul was what? When he was with them. And so last time we talked about the issue of the day of Christ. And we said the day of Christ is used in four different, it's used in exact verses, three verses. And then it's also used in different variations. And we went through and read through those verses. We also said Paul is the only one to make reference to the day of Christ. And the reasoning behind that is, is there's specific things that take place in the day of Christ that is only going to take place for us as the body of Christ. And so that's why he makes reference to it. The day of Christ and, we said, the day of the Lord are not just about events. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord is about an ultimate goal that's going to be accomplished. Does that make sense? And the goal being accomplished is that one day Christ is going to be shown as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what a wonderful day that will be. And He's going to establish His rule and authority both in the heavens and His rule and authority in the earth. Right? And we understand as the body we're going to be a participant of what's taking place in heaven and places. We understand that God is going to restore the earth through who? The nation of Israel. Right? When does the day of Christ, if we're going to put a date on when it begins, the day of Christ would begin when? At the catching away. Right? The day of Christ has events that follow. The catching up of the body, the day of redemption, the judgment seat of Christ, we receive the reward of the inheritance, and then a part of that is also going to be judgment upon those who persecute the body of Christ while it was on earth. Why do I say that? You look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look at verse 4. It says, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your what? Persecutions and tribulations that you what? Endure. And then he says, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, seeing it as a righteous thing with God 
to recompense tribulation to them that what? Are there people that trouble them? Are there people today that trouble us? Then he says in verse 7, and to you who are troubled, what do we do? Rest with us. So is there peace for us? Yes. Yeah, so he tells us to do what? He says, stop, take a rest, relax. You know, when I, I take my first folk music lessons with my piano instructor, one of the things that he always stresses, and I can't tell you how many times it's been written in my books, he says, relax. Every time. Every single time, relax. Because when you're tense, you don't play well. If we're tense in our lives and worried about things, the church here is worried about things. We talked about it last time. Are they going to rest? Are they going to be at peace? Or are they going to be troubled? They're going to be troubled in a different sense. It's not going to be in trouble with persecution, but they're going to also be troubled in the mind. And then he says, look, he says, if you were troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with who? His mighty angels. When does that take place? Well, if we don't know, we keep reading, right? And it's going to tell us something. It says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When does that take place? We understand that He's going to be revealed in that manner and in that way at the end of tribulation. He's not revealed in that manner and in that way when He comes to catch us up. But He's revealed that way when? At the end of tribulation. Then He says, when He shall come to be glorified, where? In His saints. And to be admired in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed. What does He say? In what? That day culmination, the goal is, is for him to be revealed in his what? King of kings, Lord of lords, glorified and admired where? In all of the saints. That's the goal of what the day of Christ is. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And to think about when the goal is being accomplished, we're going to be a part of that. And how we're a part of that is, is he's going to glorify and be glorified in us. And one day he's going to be glorified in his people, the nation of Israel. It's a wonderful thing to think about. Because him doing that with Israel as well is showing that God is faithful to his word of what he promises. And he's also going to be faithful to us. And so we see that, that the things there and the culmination of all of that taking place. So come back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 1 again. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that he soon be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us, but that day of Christ is what? It's at hand. But they're receiving bad information. That's what he's saying. You don't need to be troubled. You don't need to be shaken. You don't need to be fearful. Then he says, let no man deceive you by what? Any means. The day of Christ will not come to the earth until we're going to see these two things take place. There's going to be two things that need to take place. Number one is there has to be a falling away. Notice what it says there. And by the way, the phrasing is really important as it is with all of God's word. But he says, he says, let no man see you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a fallen away. What does he say? First. What needs to happen first? A what? Falling away. And then, the second thing, in that man of sin, be what? Revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, for that is worship. So that if he is God, sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what? He's going to make this display, and he's going to proclaim himself to be ultimately who? God. But before Antichrist, before you have someone, you have this figure that's able and has the ability that he's going to stand in the temple of God and say, basically he's going to come out and say, I am God. Wouldn't there be a lot of things that have to lead up to that? What's going to lead up to that? What well, describes it as what? A falling away, what happens first? 
Now some people will say, I don't want to spend, I'm not going to spend time, if there's questions, I'll spend more time on it next time, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what other people have to say about these verses. I think it's important to talk about what I think about the verses, and I could be wrong. At this point, I don't think I am, but I'm willing to receive correction on it. But I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about what other people say, because there's multiple opinions on what the falling away first is, and a lot of people refer to it as the rapture. Okay, I hear that a lot. He already talked about it, though, because I'm going to backtrack at that. So I don't, I don't think it's dealing with the rapture, because God is going to, when the body of Christ is taken up and caught up to be with Him, God is going to reinstitute His program of what He's doing in His dealings with who? The nation of Israel. We don't have any part of that. The falling away is going to be something that takes place specifically with them and has nothing to do with us, in my opinion. We're going to look at some verses on why I think that. So, the day is not going to come, but look how he starts off the verse, though. He says, let no man deceive you by any, what, means. Now, that's a verse, you can just take that and build a whole lesson on that. Because what do people want to do ultimately? They want to deceive. What is the Antichrist going to do? Specifically, it's going to be Satan. What is his goal? To what? To deceive. And he says, let no man deceive you. Go to, look at a couple of verses. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And he goes through a whole list of things of what the works of the flesh are here. And... and but he says in verse 6, I want you to look at verse 6, he says, Let no man do what? To see you, notice how they do it, with what? Vain words. So a lot of times you listen, you start to listen to someone, and it's like, man, they sound really, 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 really good. And then you start actually listening to the words they say, and the words are what? They're empty, they're void, they have no substance. But what does it do to people? It can what? Deceive them. You jump over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. You look at Colossians chapter 2. And he says, And this I say, in verse 4. He says, And this I say, lest any man should, what? God will do. And how are they going to do it? With what? Enticing words. And he looked, or dropped down to verse 8. He says, Beware, lest any man do what? Spoil you through philosophy and vain, there's that term again, what? Deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and ultimately not after what? Christ. So the things he mentioned there before, the philosophy of men, vain deceit, the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, all those things can be described as not after Christ. Now, what is the goal of Satan? The goal of Satan is, is to make it look, you don't need God, you just need yourself. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden, when he came to them, came to eat, what did he say? You can be as what? God. Did he deceive them? his goal to do that? What should we do? He says, beware. And you jump to verse 18. You jump to verse 18 in the same chapter. He says, let no man do what? Do God on you. The ultimate goal in all of that is his men want to deceive. They want to be God. They want to take you away. They want to take us away from Christ. You go with me to 2 Corinthians. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter eleven. In verse thirteen it says, For such are false apostles. And how are they described? Deceitful black workers. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Then no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into what? An angel of light. People, the world has this idea of Satan as this dark, cruel creature. 
That's exactly what he wants you to think. Because when the Antichrist comes, and that's a part of his plan, by the way, when the Antichrist comes, is he going to be this dark, cruel creature? Or is he going to be someone that's able to come into the room and he has a presence that people love? Just makes sense, doesn't it? Because he's going to declare himself to be God, and the world is going to ultimately do what? They're going to accept him as that. Think about that. Could you imagine, right now, we had someone come on the news and declare himself to be God today? We would probably all laugh, right? But there's going to be a day when a guy comes up and declares himself to be God, and the world is going to there's going, to be a bit, there's going to be things that lead up to that. It's not just going to be one day, the next day he declares himself to be God. There's going to be the seed involved. And look at what he says in verse 15. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of what? You know what that verse, you know what it reminds me of? You think of the Pharisees and the Sadducees when they're around Christ's time. Would they, did they have the appearance of being the ministers of righteousness? Sure they did. But were they the ministers of righteousness? No, because you go and you read and he says that you guys are nothing but a bunch of white sepulchers. Outside you look and you appear this, but inside you're what? You're dead. You're unrighteous. You're unholy. You have no life. Are there people like that today? You look in the world and you look at the numerous churches. What are they filled with? Because why? Satan's goal is to always attack the Word of God. If you can break down the Word of God, you can break everything else down. So when he comes, go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 3. And by the way, this issue of deception is exactly what is going to be taking place in the first three and a half years of tribulation. And he says in verse 3, he says, Let no man deceive you by any what? Means. So there's many ways about going about it, right? He says, though, for that day shall not come. What day is he talking about? He's not talking about the rapture. Because he says, except there come what? Fallen away. There's going to be events that need to happen. The day the Lord coming and taking us as the body has already taken place. So he's not referring to that. So what day is he referring to? The day he's been talking about in all the context here is the day when Christ is going to be revealed and the day when Christ is going to be glorified in the body of the saints. So he says here, For that day shall not come, except there come what? A falling away. So the two events, that's the first of the two events. So what is the falling away? I believe the falling away is a reference and it's going to describe, we're going to get some verses, on the issue of those false, I guess you could say Jewish brethren, the false Jews in the beginning of tribulation, who are going to deny Christ came in the flesh. By the way, they did that in his time. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. And they're also going to deceive, and they're going to betray, and they're going to lay the groundwork for the Antichrist to be able to declare himself to be God. He doesn't do it on his own. There's going to be a lot of help there and a lot of assistance there. Some interesting verses. Go with me. We're going to run quite a few verses here. Go with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And look at verse 18. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. It says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. But anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh who? The wicked one. And catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. 
This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed in stony places, into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and not with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is what? He also that received the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. In the care of this world and the what? Deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word, and he becometh ultimately what? A fruit. But he that received the seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So you see, there's four responses of the nation of Israel. How many is a response of belief? One. You see one response there. And the rest of what happens, the wicked one is waiting for what? His opportunity. And his opportunity to do what? To deceive. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Starting in verse 1, it says that Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be here, left here, one stone upon another, and it shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man do what? Deceive you. Why? Because there's going to be ones that comes before he comes, and what are they going to be doing? Deceiving. And he says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am who? Christ. And shall deceive many. And shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that he be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is what? Not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and diverse places. All of these are the beginning of what? So what takes place in the first three and a half years? The issue of what? Deception. The issue of hearing things. The issues of seeing things. There's going to be mass pestilence. You know what it's describing? There's going to be chaos. And what's going to happen? The Antichrist is going to come in and he's going to be this prominent figure that's going to be raised up during this time. And he's going to come in and say, it's okay, everybody. I'm going to make a treaty. And we're going to make everything all right. And the people are going to believe him to be Christ. Who's going to help him do it? The people that started with wars, the rumors of wars, the, the issues of things going on in the world, the ones coming and saying, I am Christ. And then you're going to finally have the one figure that declares himself to be Christ. And the world is not believing. That's why at first what comes, a what? Falling away. And then the man of sin is going to be what? Isn't that interesting? Because you think about the timeline, it's like, what is going on the first three and a half years? Because when we think of tribulation, in my mind, I think of the wrath of God being poured out, all the things taking place. But in order for it to build up into that point, there's a lot of other stuff that's taking place in there. And the issue of deception. Look at Luke chapter 8. Look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. In verse 4 it says, And when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked what? 
I love the I love the basic and the simplicity of it, right? If you go and plant a garden, I plant it on a bunch of rocks, what's gonna happen? And I water it. It's gonna sprout and it's gonna do what? It's done. And then it says, and some fell among thorns, and thorns sprang up with it, and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him what? Let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this error will be? And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others the parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now, the parable is this. The seed is what? The word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of where? Their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But do they make the choice by the way of that? Sure, they make the choice. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe in the time of temptation. What do they do? Fall away. Isn't that interesting what Target just used there, isn't it? What do they do? They're going to hear some things, but ultimately what happens? Fall away. And that which fell upon thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with what? Patience. But are there going to be those that are deceived? You're going to hear the word of God and ultimately be what? They're going to hear the word of God and ultimately not believe all the word of God. Go with me then to Mark chapter 4. Look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Another description here. We're just going through of what he's described in the three accounts that he gives. It says here, Mark chapter 4, verse 13, it says, He said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. The word. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh when? Immediately. Why? Because the thing that we're seeing is, is that when the word is being spread, the word of God is being spoken, the first thing he wants to do is come in and do what? To see. Attack the word of God. And take it away the word that was sown in their hearts. You know why? Because then he questions the authority of God. What did he do in the garden? Yea, hath God said. And by the way, when Satan quotes the word of God back, he quotes it correctly. He's in the garden. So Satan knows the word of God, and he uses the word of God to his advantage to this thing. There's pastors, there's pastors today that knows the word of God, rightly divided, and choose to deceive. There's going to be false Jewish brethren in the future that's going to have an understanding, and they're going to choose to deceive. It says in these, it says in then verse 16, and these are like likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh them from these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. In the future, there's going to be those that claim to be the ones sown on good ground. There's going to be the ones that claim that they're the true Jews of God. But they're not going to be that. You look at Revelation, go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 
Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse 8 and 9. It says, And under the angel of the church in Smyrna, good thing we're not in Smyrna, right? <laughs> we're in Edgewater. <laughs> These things say, The first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know that I works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are what? What does he say to call what they're doing? Blasphemy. They're Jews and are what? Not. But are the synagogue, that's pretty strong language, of who? Satan. So there's, gonna, there's these guys running around, they're claiming that they're these Jews, and God ultimately is saying what they're doing is what? Blasphemy. Because they're claiming to be the workers of righteousness. They're claiming to be the servants of God. And ultimately, they're what? They're not. They're really the servants of the devil. Just as the Pharisees were. Think about that. The Pharisees were doing exactly the same thing of what's going to take place in the future. You look at Revelation chapter 3. Go to chapter 3. Starting verse 7, he says, Then the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say, He that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are what? Not. But what do they do? But do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have what? Love thee. So there's going to be these ones that are not Jews, and he, he calls them out and he says that they're doing what? They know they're not Jews, and they, they're what? They're liars. Satan is also what? The father of lies. So is it no miracle then that the ones that are following in the steps do the same thing? And that is what they're going to be doing. And then you have 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're not going to read the whole chapter. I don't have time. My time is running so fast. But 2 Peter chapter 2. I encourage you guys to go and read the whole chapter because it's addressing a lot of the things that we're discussing here. But 2 Peter chapter 2, let's just read a few verses here, starting verse 1. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there is false teachers where? Among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves, what? Swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they, with feigned words, make what? Merchandise of you. When Satan fell, what did he do? He took the merchandise that he had, and what did he go and do? He went and sold it. What are the followers are going to be doing as well? They have this merchandise, and with their feigned words and the words that sound good and the words of deceit, what are they going to do? They're going to go and sell this merchandise. And he says, And through covetousness shall with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For God spared not the angels that sinned. But cast them down to hell and deliver them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from land, day to day, with their unlawful deeds. He calls Lot, though, a what? A righteous man. That's an interesting verse. But what was he doing to his soul? He was vaccinated. 
And it says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation to the reserve, the unjust, and the day of when? Judgment to be punished. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they self willed they are not afraid to speak of evil, of dignities, whereas angels which are greater in power might bring out random accusation against them before who? The Lord. But these, as natural brutes, may to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of the flood and righteousness, and so on. I encourage you guys to read the chapter there, because it's dealing with the issues of things that's going to take place. Part of what the falling way. They're going to be the deceitful workers. The issue of what's taking place in the first three and a half years isn't going to be just the Antichrist. It's going to be those that help promote him. And there has to be a means that he declares himself to be God. And part of that means are going to be these workers. You go to Jude. Look at Jude. Look at Jude. It's only one chapter. It always feels weird to go to a book that has one chapter. Like Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter, right? You look at Jude. You look at verse 4. For there are certain men, crept, crept and unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into what? Lasciviousness. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance Though he once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that what? Believe not. What is the end of the, the context in 2 Thessalonians 2 dealing with? He's going to destroy who? Those that did not believe and trust what? The gospel. Then he says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved them in everlasting chains and under darkness and in the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak of evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, What? The Lord do what? Rebuke thee. Verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute peace, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. Verse 11. Look at this verse. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of who? Well, what is the way of Cain? The way of Cain was the way of, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to do it in my own self-righteousness. I don't need God. I can do it my way. What are they going to be doing in the future? The same merchandise that Satan has been selling since he fell. You can do it your way. You can be as God. You don't need him. He didn't even come in the flesh. We can deny all of that. Because there's going to be something that we have that's better. We have the real deal of Christ here. And that's going to be the Antichrist declaring himself as God. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the air of the land for reward and perished in the gates and the court. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear. Clouds there without water, carried about of plants. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness for how long? Forever. Jump to verse 24. It's a down to him that is able to keep you from what? Falling. Isn't that interesting? Who's going to be able to keep them from falling? God. And part of their instruction is when you see this guy, 
standing and exalting himself to be God, you guys need to flee. Because that isn't God. Because, by the way, that's not the way Christ is going to come. Because Christ is going to come with who? His mighty angels. And they're going to know when he's revealed that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It isn't going to be this guy standing in the temple declaring himself to be God. He says, Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with his exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. That sounds like a great day, doesn't it? Because is there going to be glory and majesty? Is he going to have dominion? Is he going to have power? Does he already have it? In a sense, he does. Is he going to be displayed though? He's going to display it one day. Look at 2 John right here. Look at 2 John. 2 John. Look at verse uh, 6. It says, and this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment. That as you have heard from the beginning, you should what? Walk in. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come where? The flesh. This is a deceiver and what? Antichrist. See that? So what is the falling away first? It's going to be the event that's going to be perceived the man of sin being revealed. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. It makes sense to me. My time is up already. I wanted to talk about the man of sin, but we'll save that for next time because I think it's important. Because it gives such a great description here in 2 Thessalonians. But go back with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, Let no man in verse 3 deceive you by any means. For that they shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, for that is worship. So that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with, get with you, I told you these things. And now we know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity that is already worked, only he who now let us be left until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and mind wonders, and with all what? Deceivableness, unrighteousness, and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be what? Saved. The issue with God is, as always, take him at his word. Abram believed to God. One day the world is going to believe Antichrist. It's a scary time to think about. One of the best things to think about, though, is tells us we don't need to be shaken in mind, we don't need to be deceived, we don't have to worry about that. You know why? Because we're not going to be here for that. Because you know why? We're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to have received our glorified bodies. We're going to have received our inheritance. We're going to be oppressed. While the world is troubled, we're going to be oppressed. Is that a wonderful thing to know? It's a wonderful thing God put this in His Word. Because we would be thinking we're going to have to live through that. But He tells us here, don't worry about that. We have such a great future and a hope waiting for us. Amen? Amen. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for giving us your Word and the time to come together and be able to study your Word together. And um, thank you for saving us from the wrath that is to come. And thank you for giving us a hope that is sure and knowing that we are going to be saved from the wrath to come and that we're going to one day be glorified in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that He's going to be glorified in us. Thank you for the life we get to enjoy and um, the grace that's been given to us and the love that's been given to us so that we can go and share this wonderful message of Christ's death, His burial, and resurrection, a message that saves to